story time. Are you ready? You. You ready? So I was very lucky. I grew up with a mom who really knew how to bake and she made tons of things from scratch. Cookies, cakes, bread. Like a lot of kids, of course, what I was coveting and daydreaming about were some of those things I saw in the grocery store that she wouldn't let me get. Things like Dunkaroos. You can dunk a Dunkaroo in as much chocolate and vanilla frosting as you want. Mm. Gushers. Fruit Comic Punch Gushers Fruit Snacks. They're very, very different because they're bursting with juicy fruit punch in the middle. And Toaster Strudel. You just warm. Und Eisen on den Toppen. 16 layers of flaky, delicate pastry. By coincidence, the bus driver for my elementary school lived not too far from our house in the country. So I would walk over to her house in the mornings to catch the bus. One morning, her kids were sitting at the breakfast table and they were all indulging in toaster strudel. So I thought I'd put on my nicest sparkling smile and maybe she will offer me a toaster strudel. She did. I got my first toaster strudel in front of me. I squeezed the icing packet over it so delicately. Und Eisen on den Toppen. And when I tell you the hushed reverence with which I ate every bite and flake of this toaster strudel, it was truly one of the best things I had ever tasted. And what's funny about it now is I'm sure if I actually got one, it would not quite even be the same. <laughs> but then in that moment, I fell in love. So in this episode, we are gonna talk about everything you need to know to make my untoaster non-strudels. And I am so excited. It is gonna be so much fun. We're gonna talk about all the equipment, all the methods, how to shape them, the different kinds of fillings you can use. We'll dive in deep to that beautiful icing on top. And of course, how to bake these beauties for the flakiest results. I am so excited. As always, the recipes that we're referencing in this episode are linked in the video description below. And if you love this episode, if you love toaster strudel, if you love tiny packets of icing, und Eisen on den Toppen please do me a favor, click like and subscribe so you can be made aware of all of our new episodes as they become available. Now let's get baking. First up, let's talk about what exactly is toaster strudel. It is not strudel. We went to an authentic German baker to bring you the best strudel. Oh, good morning. First thing you need to know. So we've already talked about strudel here on Bake It Up A Notch, and strudel is a really intensely mixed dough that is made to be stretched very delicately thin, filled with filling, and it usually has lots of beautiful layers. Toaster strudel, as in the frozen product that we see sometimes in stores, is often replicated by people at home with store-bought puff pastry. However, puff pastry, whether you buy it at the store, whether it's homemade, is much flakier than what I'm used to seeing from the freezer section from Toaster Strudel. So I started taking a little bit of time to figure out exactly what kind of dough this is. And the cool thing about this dough is we can actually manipulate it. We can make it a little bit flakier if we want, or we can emulate exactly what you would get in the store in the freezer section. It's a unique dough that's a little bit more like a cross between a pastry dough and a pasta dough. Like pastry doughs, it has a high ratio of fat, but it also contains eggs and egg yolk, and that makes it a smoother dough. And you're gonna see that when we start to work with it. After that dough gets chilled, and if we want to, we can add some flakes to it, more on that later, we're gonna fill it with a nice thin layer of filling. Now, of course, it can be something fruity. I love jam for this. You're gonna wanna make sure it is a smoother filling of some sort. In this episode, I'm using things like cream cheese, chocolate hazelnut spread, and jam. After the pastries are assembled, they get frozen until really firm. And then this is the thing that is more different about them than lots of other similar sorts of pastries. We're not talking about just baking this in the oven. It gets pan fried first. And this is really key to that light, crispy flakiness on the outside edge of the pastry. And then it's also going to still need time in the oven because it can't bake sufficiently in the frying pan alone without overbrowning. So we'll give it a little bit of golden color and we'll transfer it to the oven and we're going to eat it warm. We're gonna slather it in icing. Und Eisen on den Toppen. As a kid, I did not know how to make these myself, but now I know exactly what to do. So let's get baking. <music> 
Most of the equipment you're gonna need to make toaster strudel is pretty similar to anything you'd need to make hand pies. We're gonna use things like a rolling pin, a pastry wheel, a pastry brush, a paring knife, a fork to do a little crimping. Pretty basic stuff, but there's a couple things that are gonna be different about this recipe. We're gonna mix the dough in the food processor until we get a nice smooth dough. And we're also going to need a non-stick skillet for doing our pan frying. This is really important to getting that perfect golden exterior. The last thing you're gonna find really helpful is a ruler. I know that makes it sound like this is a really precise baking project, but it's more about getting it filled to the absolute capacity so that we've got filling and pastry in every bite. This dough comes together super quickly thanks to the food processor. Now we're gonna start off with some all-purpose flour and fine sea salt. Now, as always, the ingredients and all the recipes that we're using in this episode are linked in the video description below, so be sure to check that out. I'm going to add my flour, which is uh, three cups or 360 grams, and I'm gonna add a teaspoon of fine sea salt into this as well. I'm gonna give that a pulse just for my own satisfaction of combining the dry ingredients first. Great. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our butter. Now, unlike when I'm making pie dough and I really sometimes wanna leave bigger pieces of butter in there for a few different reasons, in this recipe, we are just gonna combine the butter almost completely. There should only be very tiny visible pieces intermixed throughout the dough and no big chunks. It should pretty much be completely combined. And a lot of times the visual cue that people give um, in this kind of instance is that the whole mixture should look sort of like a coarse meal. And what it means is sort of like cornmeal. It's going to change color because the butter is gonna be in there with the flour and it's going to become a little bit grainier, more granular than flour is alone. And you can pulse this or just leave it on and running either way. Um, and we can just watch as that flower is gonna change color and consistency. Great. That's actually a really good indicator that it's done is when it almost starts to come together because the butter has been so dispersed throughout it that it's even actually starting to hydrate the mixture a little bit. Now we're gonna add one large egg and one large egg yolk. Now save your egg white because we're gonna use that later to help us seal these toaster strudel and make sure that our edges are really, really stuck together. Okay, so the egg mixture, I just went ahead and pulsed it a little bit to incorporate it and now we're gonna add just enough water to bring this mixture together. It's gonna be about half a cup. Beautiful. Okay, our dough has come together. It's kind of formed a ball around the food processor blade, which is a good sign that it is ready for us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it out. I'm gonna divide it into two even pieces and form them into rectangles about one inch thick. This way I can wrap them up really tightly and get them chilling because I want them to get nice and cold before we start the next step. So. It is good to know that you can also mix this dough by hand by just incorporating that fat really, really carefully with your fingers or with a pastry cutter and then adding the rest of the ingredients and kind of mixing or kneading until it is smooth. In my quest for the perfect toaster strudel, one of the things that I thought about is how to make one that is as close as possible, more of a replica of what you would get in the freezer section. But I mentioned you can also add folds to this dough. So this is kind of an optional step. I'm leaving it up to you and I'm gonna show you all three ways of what it looks like. No folds with one fold, with two folds. But what's important to know is it just makes a lighter, flakier, more voluminous final pastry. So chilling is a really important step at this stage. No matter what, whether you're folding it or not, we need to get it nice and chilled before we work with it again. Before I toss these in the fridge, let's talk about my first make ahead tip for these toaster strudel. Like I said, this is a little bit of a project, but luckily there are multiple places throughout the process that you could go ahead and take a break for a while. And right after mixing the dough is one of them. The dough can be chilled at this point up to 48 hours. So it's a great thing that you could just toss the dough together one day and let it chill until you're ready to make some strudel. The 
The main thing you're looking for in a toaster strudel filling is something nice and smooth and preferably a little bit on the thick side. Something thicker is going to allow us to get a nice even coating on as much of the dough as possible without as much risk of it coming out the sides. So that's really important. We wanna make sure that every bite has got a little bit of the filling inside. I have a few favorite fillings in front of me. I like to use things like chocolate hazelnut spread. Um, you could also use peanut butter or almond butter or cookie butter maybe in something like this. Then of course we've got some jam. A fruit filling is great for a pastry like this and it gives that little bit of brightness. So I love any kind of jam. Just make sure that if it's got big chunks, you give it a quick blitz in the blender or food processor to kind of help break some of that up and thicken the jam a little too. My final favorite is something like cream cheese. And actually when I was testing these toaster strudel, I even made a savory toaster strudel using scallion cream cheese and pepper jelly. And it was so delicious. But in this episode, I'm keeping it sweet with cream cheese and brown sugar. All of these make really great, awesome fillings, but of course I wanna hear what filling ideas you have. So be sure to tell us in the comments what kind of toaster strudels you're dreaming of. Our dough has been chilling. It needs to chill for at least one hour. And like I said, up to 48 hours. So this dough is nice and firm now. It's really, really chilled and the texture is gotten nice and firm. It's gonna be easy for rolling it. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw in a fold to this dough. So let's talk about the folds. I mentioned that these folds are optional and that's because you're going to see this final texture in the end. I'm gonna show you what it looks like if you just throw one fold in it or if you throw two folds into it, which is I think now my favorite toaster strudel. It's a little bit flakier, a little bit lighter, but this fold is super easy. If you've seen my episode of Bake It Up a Notch where we talk about my rough puff pastry, this is just like that folding process. What we're gonna do is we're gonna roll it out to about a half an inch thick. You don't really need to worry about the exact size, width of the dough here. We're just focusing on the thickness. And you don't really need to worry about the shape too much either, though I'm trying to keep it a bit rectangular in shape just cause that's what I want it to be when we are actually gonna roll it out. And after I get it rolled out to about a half an inch thickness, I'm just gonna go ahead and fold it into quarters. So I do this by folding it in half and then in half again. Just folding it into quarters till we have this nice little dough rectangle dough packet. Perfect. And now we can refrigerate this again. If the dough is still feeling cool and chilled, this one actually is right now, you could go ahead and throw your second fold in it right now. Just remember that if it feels sticky or soft at all, that it's gonna be much more in your favor to refrigerate it for just a few minutes before you continue. So since this dough has got its fold, I'm gonna go ahead and grab another piece of dough that I already have ready and let's shape some toaster strudel. When you're ready to assemble your toaster strudel, you wanna work with just one piece of dough at a time. And this is for a few different reasons, but mainly because we are rolling this dough super thin. We're rolling it to an eighth of an inch thick. So because of that, we don't wanna have to be working with lots of pieces simultaneously. We wanna keep all of our dough in the refrigerator to the last possible minute and then bring it out only when we're ready to work with it. So I'm gonna start by rolling this dough out into a rectangle. I'm gonna start by trying to get it to about um, 12 by 14 inches, which is more than we need. So the idea is that we're gonna take it to 12 to 14 inches so that it's exactly the width that we need that we can trim off a little bit of that excess. So don't worry if it's not a perfect rectangle um, because we are gonna be trimming some of it away. But the main goal with getting it to that dimension is that that is definitely where it's going to be thin enough for our toaster strudel. So that's why we've got our ruler handy. I'm gonna check my measurements a few times, flour my dough as needed while I work, and we'll get it to 12 by 14 inches. Okay, so I've got it to 12 inches here. I'm gonna just go ahead, use my ruler to trim off some of the excess. And this is something I actually do a lot of the time when I am rolling out a dough. I think about what size I want it to be and then I just roll it a little bit wider than that rather than trying to roll it 
to that exact thickness. That way I've built in that little bit of excess so that I can just trim up the sides as I need to. And you know, we can bake this little scrap dough. We can toss it in some cinnamon sugar. It would be delicious. My final trim size that I need is about 10 and a half by 12. And sometimes I think people get intimidated by this kind of baking project that has a lot of exact measurements. The only reason I've been so exacting with these measurements is so that I can tell you what size is how much exact filling we can use. These precision, these little details are really only for that purpose. If your toaster strudel dough is a little bit off in size, keep going. It's gonna be a-okay. This is definitely one of those times where even if they look a little bit, you know, wonky or messy in any way, it's going to be 100% just as delicious. So now what I'm gonna do is across my side that is 12 inches, the longer side here, I'm gonna go ahead and just use my pastry wheel to mark where about halfway is. The reason for this is that we're actually gonna make these and assemble them a little bit more like you might assemble a ravioli than something like a hand pie. We're actually gonna fold this top dough down onto this other dough. This is just gonna make it easier to get a nice seal because one side is already gonna be nice and sealed in for us. So now that I've got kind of that halfway point marked, I'm gonna just divide this into three pieces so that I know exactly how much filling I should be putting into each. And I'm not actually cutting here. I'm just very lightly using the pastry wheel to mark the dough. So I've just made these little marks. If you are scared of doing that, another thing that you can do is even use like the handle of a spoon or a fork to kind of draw a little bit, or you can use the back of a paring knife to kind of make this little line indentation without cutting in. So we're gonna start adding our filling into the center here. Um, and I use about two tablespoons of filling. And what I wanna do is start by putting them in the center and then we're gonna spread them out into a nice even layer. We wanna make sure we leave half an inch excess uncovered all the way around that outside edge because we wanna make sure we have plenty of dough around that edge to be able to seal these so that they're not gonna open up when we go to pan fry them. So I find this a very soothing part of the process. Cue soothing music. And it's just gonna be me like, All right, once I've got my fillings inside, I made myself a little variety sampler pack here of all my favorite fillings. I'm gonna use that egg white that I saved from before. I added about a tablespoon of water to it just to make it a little bit easier uh, to brush. And I'm gonna brush it all along those uncovered edges right in between my fillings. And if you were making one batch and you were just making them all filled with chocolate hazelnut spread or all filled with jam, um, you would just take it right in between your jam layers. The proteins in the egg whites are really gonna help this to seal so that we don't get any filling coming out. That is so important when we only have that little bit of filling inside. Now this is the part where I say we're shaping it a little bit more like pasta because we're just gonna lift it up and fold it over and then press really, really well up here. And then start to press on our sides and in between. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get any air that's trapped inside to kind of come out anywhere that we haven't sealed it yet. So you can just kind of be pressing it. We're just, that's what I mean when I say we're making it more like a ravioli because we really want that dough to be fully formed around that filling entirely with no pockets of air trapped inside. And I think we've got it here, which is great. So now I'm gonna press really, really firmly with my fingers. If it feels sticky, warm, or soft at any stage, you wanna go ahead and give it a second to chill. But mine's still feeling okay. I'm gonna go ahead and use my pastry wheel, or you could use a knife, to cut carefully in between where they were filled. And if you have too much excess down here, you can cut a little bit of that away too. Um, and then I like to seal them with a fork because even though we have that egg white in there, 
we wanna make sure that we give it that little bit of extra physical manipulation of just really pressing the top dough into the bottom dough to make sure it's sealed. And I'm just using the tines of a fork. Now, the more you handle this, and especially we're in summer months, this is going to get soft on you. So sometimes I find it's helpful after all that shaping to chill it before you do these fork marks, only from the standpoint of it can start to get kind of floppy at this stage, transferring it from one thing to another. So you can always do this crimping and everything right on your parchment lined baking sheet, just to make sure that you're not gonna have to handle it any more than necessary. So actually for these last two, I'll go ahead and transfer it and we'll just do that crimping right on there. Then they need to be chilled. So we need to give them a nice good freeze before we start to pan fry. Once your pastries are assembled, this is actually the great stopping point for my make ahead tip number two. You can take the assembled pastries, freeze them solid, and instead of going immediately into the pan frying step, you can transfer them to an airtight container and they can be stored for up to one month. That way you're ready to have toaster strudels any morning. All right, I've been heating up some neutral oil here as we're getting ready to pan fry our frozen toaster strudel. Now it's really warm in our studio here, so I'm just gonna work with one at a time and leave those other ones in the freezer for now. But if you've got a big enough skillet, you can definitely do a couple of these at a time. Um, I've got you know, a good quarter inch of oil. This is a true pan fry. So I'm gonna go ahead and just add my chilled pastry into the pan and we're going to let it pan fry for a few minutes on each side to allow it to get really nice and golden brown. And then we'll transfer it to a parchment lined baking sheet. You can drain it on some absorbent paper towels first if you want, um, but go ahead and transfer it to a baking sheet and we'll let it finish in the oven so that we can make sure it's baked all the way through and it doesn't just have beautiful golden flaky outer layers and a gummy center. We wouldn't want that. And frying these pastries first gives them this nice even golden brown color and a little bit of that extra rich flakiness. It's, it's hard to describe until you break into one of these, but it is really, really special. But pan frying them alone is not going to get the dough baked all the way through. So now that they have had their pan fry time, it's time to put them in a 375 degree oven for about 15 to 18 minutes until they are fully baked through. And they will get a little bit more even in their overall golden color while they bake. Into the oven they go. The best part about making toaster strudel at home is that we can put as much icing on them as we want. No tiny little packets. Und icing on den Toppen. I'm gonna make a big batch of my favorite icing and we are just going to slather them if we want to in said icing. So while our strudels bake, let's make the icing, shall we? Yes. Okay, this icing is as simple as it comes. It's just a very basic powdered sugar icing glaze situation. But I do, I've talked about this maybe a couple of times on Bake It Up a Notch before, but my favorite way to make icing is not with milk, but with cream. This makes a huge difference in both the viscosity of the final icing. It's beautiful and thick and shiny, but it also has that little bit of extra richness that just milk alone doesn't provide. So I really think that it's wonderful and special. Of course, you could also use half and half. You could also use milk. You could use the dairy-free milk of your choice. However much cream or liquid that you're going to add is going to make it thinner. And for this purpose, I like to make the icing a bit thicker because we're often going to be applying it to a warm pastry. If the icing is really thin and it hits a warm pastry, it's going to become even gooier and meltier on the spot. But if we keep it a little bit thicker, then it's going to just soften and be beautiful. So I like to add some vanilla or vanilla bean paste, extract, whatever to this. Go ahead and add that first. And then I'm going to add just enough heavy cream, a few tablespoons to bring my powdered sugar to a nice pipeable, drizzleable consistency. The 
good news, as always, about baking is that there are a lot of preventable mistakes. And with toaster strudel, I feel like if you know some of these things ahead of time, you're likely not gonna run into these problems. But I wanna show them to you because that's what we do here on Bake It Up A Notch. We like to make sure that we talk about all the potential mistakes. So first potential mistake, when I was talking about closing our dough and getting all those air pockets out, what will happen if you get an air pocket trapped in there? This is what will happen. You're gonna end up with that air wanting to escape somehow. Now, in a pie or in other certain pastry applications, we even cut vents to allow that steam or any excess air that's in there to escape. But in this case, we don't wanna cut any vents. We don't want any of that filling running out. We, we just don't want that happening. So. If there's an air pocket, that air is going to find a way to escape and it will burst out. And in some cases, it'll make a big, you know, noticeable thing like this. In other cases, it'll be a little less noticeable, just like a little pocket of air. But it's also going to be noticeable when we open into it that there's going to be kind of a, you can see it right there. See, like just a big hole where that air pocket was and there's no filling there. Like we want to be able to have a nice, bite of filling in each bite. So if you ever notice that there is an air pocket, but you're already done shaping, just take the tip of a paring knife and actually pierce that air pocket. Even if you make a little bit of a hole and allow the air to come out, and that's what we're really going for. I can actually even feel with this particular toaster strudel, which we made yesterday, that it's also compared to the other ones around it really soggy. And that's another thing that can happen if that air builds up inside and it doesn't have anywhere to go, it tries to expel itself, but then some of that steam is still caught inside and during cooling can actually sog out your pastry. So really be careful with those air bubbles. We don't want that to happen. We also talked about making sure we seal really well using egg wash, and a fork to seal. Make sure you give yourself enough room around the edge of your filling to make sure you're gonna get good dough to dough contact so that we can seal those two doughs together. Because as you can see here in one of our jam strudels, some jam ran out. And while this isn't the end of the world, this is still gonna be a tasty pastry and we can even mop up some of that caramelized jam that looks really good to me actually. But even so, we're not gonna have as much filling in each bite, and that's gonna be a disappointment compared to the other ones on this tray, so make sure you're sealing well. The last thing that happens that is something that I think is really important, especially when we're baking things in the summer, sometimes it can be difficult to chill things properly, and I mentioned that these pastries need to be nice and frozen before we start pan frying them. Now you might be tempted to skip that time or shorten it, but it's really, really important, mainly because if these pastries are not cold when they hit that hot oil, they are going to be very, very difficult to handle. They're gonna be kind of soft and flopsy. It's gonna be more difficult to turn them over midway through the fry. So we just wanna make sure that they are nice and cold. And luckily these are thin pastries. So chilling them sufficiently doesn't take too long. These pastries have just come out of the oven and I wanna let them cool for at least 10 minutes before I apply any icing to them and enjoy eating them. I love to eat these pastries warm, which is just another great reason to make them at home, make them yourself so you can enjoy them at the peak of freshness. But I recognize that this is quite a baking project and it does require some precision. So this is time for my final make ahead tip. You can actually fully make these pastries, let them cool completely, and then transfer them to an airtight container where they can freeze in your freezer for up to a month and you can refresh them, rewarm them, retoast them anytime you want. Now we're gonna get into this a little bit later, but if they are thin enough, you can actually just toast them in a toaster, which is wonderful. If they're a little bit thicker and flakier, you may need to use a toaster oven or your actual oven just to refresh them, recrisp that outer pastry shell and warm up that filling. I cannot wait to eat these. I'm gonna get them ready to ice them up. To flake or not to flake? That is the question. As a flake fanatic, I could not help but take this recipe to a very flaky place. But I want to acknowledge that it is possible to make a product that's a little bit more like the store bought one, if that's what you're going for. So I've got three toaster strudels in front of me. The first one I'm going to break into had 
no folds done to the dough. So this is just, we made the dough, we chilled it, and then immediately went into shaping it. And as you can see, we've got visible flakage. I can even hear it. Hold on. Can you hear that, Tim? <laughs> I'm just saying, you can like hear the flakes. And so you can hear the flakes a little bit, but it's much thinner. So you can see just thickness wise, like this would actually fit in a toaster, I think. See how much thinner that is? Cause it doesn't have that added flake. But when we break it open, you're gonna see, oh yeah, it's flaky. It's got visible flakage is happening. You still like by definition, this is what I think of when I think of a toaster strudel. Nice and light, nice and flaky, but as good as that is, and that's looking good. What happens when we add one fold to it? Oh, oh. I'm gonna show the overhead camera first, cause look at this. It like, honestly, I could, I could cry guys. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So flaky, look at that. Ding. It's beautiful. That's only one fold. One fold, okay, two folds. <laughs> it's so flaky. <laughs> oh, this makes me so happy. This is what's so cool about this. This is all the same recipe and any of these would be delicious. And yes, a couple of them take a little bit more time. But what's so cool is that you can spend an extra 15 minutes and literally see the difference that you made, you manipulated this. That is so cool to me. Baking is so cool. Hold on. They all wanna be friend, flake friends. Eee. Flake friends. Okay, I don't think I even have anything else to say, but like, look at this. Should we just shoot the thumbnail right now? Cause I'm in a great mood. Now I've got all of the different flavors, all of the different flake levels of toaster strudel in front of me, and I'm gonna put icing on a bunch of them. And that for me is truly the most fun part of the toaster strudel at home experience. So I've got a little disposable pastry bag here filled with my icing. And you know, I feel like there's different ways that you can go about toaster strudeling. There's certainly the classic back and forth drizzle. I also feel like you can go, if you like a little more coverage, it's like about the stripes turned into the crisscross. This is what I used to do. If I could ever, sometimes I could negotiate one of my friends to give me one of their packets. And then I had two packets for a single strudel. And if you had two packets, you could get away with this. And of course, we don't have to even pipe it on. We can spread drizzle or we can dunk. <laughs> and the live audience agrees. <laughs> There's the dunk and then there's also the like internal drizzle. Mmm. <sighs> Look at this flake. <laughs> this is really the best day I've had in a long time. <laughs> So much for joining me for this very flaky, very icing covered episode of Bake It Up a Notch. Und icing on den Toppen. It's honestly one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. And I really, really hope it inspires you to get baking. I really had fun recreating this memory from my childhood. And honestly, it's been a lot of fun making it even better than what I remember. If this episode inspires you to make your own pastries, please use hashtag Bake It Up a Notch. Let us know what flavors you're making in the comments. We love to see what you're making. 
making in your own kitchens. As always, all of the recipes for this episode are linked in the video description below, and you can snag them there so you can make each and every one for yourself. Be sure to join us for our next episode where we are making a giant frosted birthday cookie, and I can't wait. Until then, happy baking. Untoaster non strudels.